Well, last week, uh, Jean Dolores Smith celebrated her 101st birthday. And I don't know what it is about older people, but I just, I love reading stories and hearing stories and even hearing comments from older people, especially when they've been here on this earth for a whole century. And Jean, or as she's called, Sister Jean, is the active chaplain of the Loyola men's basketball team. And every year for the last 25 or so years, she has met with basketball players and prayed with them and traveled with the team, especially uh, for the NCAA tournaments. I'm sure you've seen her actually praying uh, with the Loyola men's basketball team before a tournament game. She was born in 1919. Uh, that means that she was born during the last year of the 20th century uh, Spanish flu pandemic, which again swept uh, thousands and thousands of lives from people around the world. And this lady, Sister Jean, continues to live an incredibly active ministry life, even at uh, the year of 101 years that she spent here on this earth. Six months ago, uh, our world began to realize that uh, we were in big trouble again. Uh, people started dying in China from this strange virus that uh, most of us at that point couldn't even name and really could care very little about. And then the seriousness of this virus uh, registered on most people in the United States when the National Basketball Association uh, shut down their season. And then following the shutdown of the NBA season, uh, the college baseball season was shut down and there was no World Series in college baseball. And then the public school systems completely shut down and it wasn't long before our whole country, our whole nation, uh, as well as many other nations in the world, uh, shut down the economies of uh, our nation and other nations around the world. And so we know what it's like to, to be pursued by an enemy. Uh, we know what it's like to be in danger and face threats of danger uh, from enemies. And the, the day that a person is conceived, I believe that the battle for life at that point actually begins. Um, quite often, choices other people make uh, determine the kind and the quality of life that we experience. And that means that consequently, Choices that we make affect the lives of other people in the same kind of way. Last week in Psalm 60, we discovered how to be victorious in spiritual war uh, against sin and death and, and Satan. And Psalm 61 picks up and describes options that we have when we're being pursued uh, by an enemy when we find ourselves engaged in spiritual war. As the God-appointed leader of uh, a very sinful people, the nation of Israel, David had found himself often running for his life. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 18, for example, uh, David found himself running from his own son, Absalom. And that could be the setting of Psalm 61. And so today, as we look at Psalm 61, we want to look for ways that we can follow David's example when we feel threatened and when we are under physical and emotional and even spiritual attack. And so, like Sister Jean, I want to encourage you today because you're alive and you still have ministry days ahead of you. And those ministry days can be filled with victory even in the midst of uh, threats that come at us from enemies. Uh, I don't know everything about Sister Jean's life, and I don't know everything about your life, but I do know this. I know you can be encouraged when you turn to God in prayer in times of need. Just like Sister Jean pay, prays with uh, those Loyola basketball players before a big game, when the enemy's coming against you, I want to challenge you as we draw from Psalm 61 today to learn how to turn to God in prayer 
when we're under our greatest threat. So open your Bible with me to Psalm 61, and let's read together uh, this great psalm. Psalm 61, uh, the superscript says to the choir master with stringed instruments of David. Verse 1, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you with my, when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. God, we thank you today for the power of your word. We thank you for what you want to teach us today through the life of David. And God, I pray right now you will just open up our hearts. God, may we feel your loving arms wrapped around us. May we feel your voice of encouragement to us through the power of your word. And may we resolve in our heart today that we're going to take whatever action is necessary to follow the example of David that we've just read about in this great song that came from his heart in a great time of struggle for him. Lord, lead us now as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, David was a great example for us, a great source of, of strength and hope for us as he cries out to God and petitions God for help. And in this psalm, look for four bedrock principles to know and to follow as we draw from the testimony of David's life today. The first one is this, God sustains through prayer. We see that right out of the bat in verses 1 and 2. David called on God to provide through prayer. In verse 1 he says, Hear my cry. Do you sense the, the desperation of David? Hear my cry. When you, when you cry, there, there are a couple reasons why you cry. One could be you cry out because you're in pain. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case of David right here. Uh, another case could be that you cry out to God when you're distressed, when you're troubled. And I think that was the case for David here. He says, hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know, God listens to those who have faith in Him and who call on Him. A.W. Tozer, that great giant from Canada of the past century, said, and I quote, Faith, like a muscle, grows by stretching. You understand that principle, don't you? you? You go and you exercise and you might feel tired, you might feel worn out, you might feel a little bit broken down. But when you exercise your muscles, they grow back stronger. And that's why we do practices of, of exercise. And our faith is, is no different. Uh, no pain and no gain. When we, when we stretch our faith, it grows. Faith is a living, active confidence in God. And David displays this. He displays that, that faith is a firm reliance on God in every circumstance. But especially, especially when we come to a time of crisis. And so the degree of your faith is reflected in your prayer life. I believe that with all of my heart. David had run to the end of the earth in verse 1. That means that he was in a foreign land. He had, he had had to flee. He had had to run away uh, from the safety and security of where he reigned as king in, in Jerusalem. And that meant that he was away from the dwelling place of God. 
the tabernacle. He couldn't gather with God's people in worship. And in verse 1, it says his heart was faint. He felt faint, indicating the fact that he was discouraged. He was weak. We know what that's like, don't we? I mean, I've, I've experienced life with some people this week who have felt that because we haven't been able to gather to worship over the, over the last few weeks, they become weary. They become tired. They fall into temptation. They've even become very, very, very discouraged. And that's the way David was feeling at this particular time in his life. Emotionally, he felt that he was kind of at the end of his rope. And that's the expression that I have felt from many people that I've experienced life with even this very week. But look at what David did. David found a hiding place more secure than a physical rock. You see it in verse 2. He says, the rock that is higher than I. This was not a place. This was a person. The rock that David ran to and clung to was God Himself. And that's what I would recommend for you and me today as well. David's refuge was that close intimacy, that personal relationship that he had with God. In other words, he he felt the security of God's loving arms wrapped around him because he had that personal relationship with God. And oh, how I pray you have that personal relationship with God that in your time of desperation you can feel God's loving arms wrapped around you and that will be the rock that you run to and you will express that through the prayer that you pray just like David did. David's refuge was that close intimacy of his personal relationship with God. And his faith was reflected in his actions. He cried out to God. He had taken all precautions to survive. He had run away from his home city where he reigned as king. He did what he had to do. He quarantined himself, uh, so to speak. But rather than running from hill to hill to hill to hill, he ran to a secure place. And he did what was most significant. He clung to his relationship with God to be the greatest source of strength, to be his rock that he held on to. He drenched his life in prayer. So his personal relationship with God gave him all the security that he needed. And I trust that through this time of challenge and struggle and running from the enemy called COVID-19 that we've been experiencing. I trust that it's drawn you to a close prayer relationship with God. God leads those who put their faith and trust in Him and call on Him in prayer. Now, David wasn't just saying prayers. He was calling out to God, a personal God that he knew, with the prayer of his soul. He was pouring out his soul to God. And God sustained him through prayer, as God will sustain you through prayer if you turn to him as well. In 1735, uh, there was a ship on its way from England to the United States. And on board that ship was a young Anglican preacher. His name was John Wesley. And John Wesley had been invited to be the pastor of believers, Christians, British colonists who had settled in the state of Georgia, in Savannah, Georgia. And on that voyage, bad weather set in and the ship was in serious trouble. And John Wesley feared that the ship was going to sink. And he was actually the chaplain of that sea vessel, that ship. But he feared for his life. He couldn't help but notice that there was a group of Moravian Christians, German Moravian Christians, who were sitting over in the corner of the ship, and they did not seem to be disturbed at all. In fact, they were singing hymns. Uh, 
They were praising and worshiping God through the very worst part of the storm. And when they started to depart from the ship, uh, Wesley went over to the leader of the Moravians and he asked them about their security during the storm. And the Moravian responded with a question. He looked at Wesley and he said, Do you have faith in Christ? And that very question shook John Wesley's world. He was a preacher. He was going to minister to Christians in Savannah, Georgia. And yet with that question, he realized that he didn't have that rock in his life. He didn't have the rock to turn to for security that those faithful Moravian Christians had. And that question continued to challenge Wesley for the next three years. For three years he struggled. And then on May 24, 1738, he had an experience that changed everything. Wesley describes the event in his journal. And here's what he says, and I quote, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a meeting where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that He had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. End of quote. See, Wesley had been looking for works for his salvation. He had been looking inward. He had been looking to his self, his own ac actions to put his trust in. And that was not a rock that was secure enough to sustain him through a storm where he thought his life was going to be taken. Let me ask you today, do you have faith in Christ? Now, I'm not asking, do you know about Christ? I'm not asking, are you working in a ministry, maybe even in your church? I'm asking you, do you have the solid rock to hang on to in your life? Do you know Christ? That's the most important question you could ever answer in your life. So the degree of your faith is reflected in your prayer life. In your prayer life, are you just saying prayers that you've rotely said over and over and over again? Or are you praying through a relationship, a solid relationship that you have with Christ? Well, the second bedrock principle that David teaches us to know and follow is this. God sustains with protection. We see this in verses 3 through 5. David called on God for protection through his trouble. As a teenager, David had received the strength of God when he was out shepherding his sheep and the lion came or the bear came to take one of his sheep. David knew that God had given him the strength to kill the bear, kill the lion, and protect his, his sheep. David also knew that God had given him strength uh, not to fight against the authority figure in his life, King Saul. As long as Saul lived for the last few years, he chased after David to take David's life. But David knew that God gave him the strength to withstand the temptation to take his authority figure's life in his own hands. David also knew that God had given him strength against the giant Goliath and, and defeat the Philistines by taking down uh, a, a giant who was profaning the, the name of, of holy God. And so David knew what it was like to depend on God. And David knew from experience that God was dependable. So what did he do when he came to his time of, of struggle? He, 
He turned to God in prayer. Look at, look at verse 3. He says, For you have been my refuge. I mean, there, there was a, a plethora of events that had happened in David's life where he knew that God had protected him with the strength of God's arms himself. You have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Selah. So what is a refuge? David says God is his refuge. A refuge is a shelter in danger. So under attack, under threatening circumstances, God was David's refuge, as he can be your refuge. I remember in the early days of our quarantine, I would spend an hour or so every day looking at uh, a documentary from World War II, The Band of Brothers, and it was amazing to me at how many thousands and thousands of lives of men on both sides of the war uh, were, were actually saved by men bunkering down in bunkers or, or digging foxholes to, to hide in under enemy attack or hiding behind trees or hiding behind barns, hiding behind other shelters. Men would find a shelter. Very brave, valiant men would find shelter when the enemy attack would come. And that's what David did here. He found his refuge in God. We also know that David refers here to his strong tower. His strong tower was uh, a place that uh, he knew very well, uh, a high place in a, in a wall city. And David found his security in the stability of God's strength during his um, dur during his life of ease before enemy attacks came he knew that he had to build that strong tower uh, to to find refuge in and he knew what it was like even when he was running away to find refuge in God back during my youth ministry days we would often take uh, groups of youth up to Fort Caswell just above the South Carolina North Carolina line and when you go out to Fort Caswell, the first thing you see, you can't help but see it, is this huge lighthouse. And the base of the lighthouse is huge and secure. Uh, and it's, in, it's just withstood uh, hundreds and hundreds of storms. Up in the very top, which uh, telescopes up to the top, uh, there's, there's a clear glass structure all the way around the top of the lighthouse where you can see from every direction. That lighthouse is there to protect ships from running ashore, but it's also there uh, to look out and see where the enemy might be coming from uh, to attack you. And David knew that God was his strong tower. And I trust and pray today that you trust God to be your strong tower. David gives another analogy of a tent. A tent was a dwelling place. It was a place of safety and security and warmth and convenience. And David longed to dwell where God lived, where God dwelled. He knew that that was a place of intimate security and intimate fellowship with God Himself. Since the days of Moses and the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel, God had established the tabernacle where, unlike all other uh, false gods, God had chosen to live among His people and dwell in the tabernacle. And David loved the tabernacle because that's where he felt the presence of God most intimately and most securely. God dwelt with His people. And David treasured, he treasured being with God and how he felt a, a warmth and security in the presence of God. And then he gives a fourth analogy, and that's a shelter where uh, he, he gives the picture of a mother bird putting the baby chicks, the baby birds, underneath the wing of the mother bird. And this was the position of being sheltered, being sheltered from, from harm. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus picks up on this same analogy where, where, where Jesus said, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? 
Jesus used this same analogy that David was using here about his relationship with being protected under the wings of God. So with these four images, David simply was saying, fellowship with God is ultimate life. Now I trust that you have that same kind of relationship with God where your fellowship with Him takes priority over every other form and source of strength in life. Because fellowship with God is ultimate life. So how has God been your refuge, your strong tower, your tent, your source of protection, the wings under which God protects you? Too often, I fear that most people, you know, dig into our personal resources to solve the threat that comes against us on our own. And then if we don't have the the personal resources to, to, to fight off the enemy, we turn to someone else or somewhere else for protection or for help. And then as a final resort, maybe if 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 we can't have the strength in ourselves or find help from someone else, ultimately finally we turn to God. That's not what David did. And that's not what I recommend that you and I do either. I recommend that you follow the pattern of David and turn to the source of strength that God wants to give first. As a first response and not a last resort. David got it right. And I trust and pray that you will as well. So why did David do that? And why do I recommend that you do that? Well, look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. See, David was faithful to his commitment to God. He didn't just have a shallow, you know, whenever I want to come to worship or whenever I want to praise God, you know, that's when I'll depend on God. That's when I'll trust in God. That's when I'll praise God. No, it was a normal, regular, everyday part of his life. He was faithful to his commitment to God. His vows spoke of his uh, unwavering commitment to God. His apparent trouble was no match whatsoever for the faith that he had in God. And I trust that that's true for you today as well. See, David claimed his heritage. God had promised him that he was going to bless him. So again, how has God been your refuge, your strong tower, your tent, your shelter? I want to challenge you to do something with me this week. I want to challenge you to take your journal and just think back over your life to the times that God has been faithful to you and write out those experiences in your journal so you can feel them, you can touch them, you can remember them. Now, as I ask you to do that, I I fear that, that some of you are afraid to write down how you've depended on the promises of God from the past, maybe because you haven't done that. Now, if that is you, uh, I want to challenge you not to, not to be remorseful about the past, not to regret what you haven't done in the past, but start today with a white sheet of paper. Start today with a fresh new script and begin to experience God personally today and then... Write down the ways in which He is faithful to you in fulfilling His promises to you today as you know Him and learn to love Him and learn to serve Him. David's faith in God's all-sufficient power sustained him through trouble. And I promise you, as you learn to trust God and turn to Him, He will be faithful to you to sustain you as well. So God sustains us through prayer, and God sustains us through protection. Thirdly, the third bedrock principle to know and to follow is 
God sustains with his promises. We see this in verses 6 and 7. David called on God to show his allegiance to the promise that God had made to him. In verse 6, he says, Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Now it's interesting here because David was praying for himself. himself. And that's what you and I ought to do as well. Sure, we ought to pray for other people. Sure, we ought to give praises in our prayers to God. But we need to also pray for ourselves. And the best way we can pray for protection from God is to follow the example of David and claim the promises that God has given for us. See, David did pray for protection in the foreign land, but David also prayed for God to extend his dynasty, which wasn't just some fabricated dream that, that, that David had about what he wanted God to do for him. God had promised him that he was going to build a dynasty around him that would last for, listen to this, eternity. And David knew that, and so David claimed that promise from God. David looked ahead to the coming Messiah, promised by the prophet Nathan, that's recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. And then he prayed to experience God's steadfast love and God's faithfulness. David prayed because he trusted the promises of God. He knew that the promises of God were the solid rock that he could stand on, that would secure his life for not just time on this earth, but for eternity. We, we have a couple of missionaries in Palmetto Shores Church who, who have served for the last uh, 12 years in Zambia. Since last December, they have had to be here home on furlough because of COVID-19, and they haven't been able to travel back and forth. So this past week, they sent out a message to all of their prayer partners to join them in fasting and praying one day a week for the next month for the future ministry that they have with God, especially with reference to Zambia. Now, I love that strategy See, that strategy takes us to the promises of God, takes us to the heart of God. The promises of God are given on God's terms. And we can't claim the promises of God until we know the promises of God. And what better way to have a clear word from God than to fast and pray and ask God to reveal to us His promises so that we can trust His promises. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 22, the Bible says that the Lord your God, this is, this is God speaking to Moses when Moses was taking the children of Israel through the wilderness wanderings, preparing them to move into the promised land. In verse 22 of Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them at once, lest the wild beast grow too numerous for you. See, God told Moses that, you know, he could have gone in and just wiped out the, the residents of the promised land for Israel, but it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea to do that. He needed to lead them little by little for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons he gave was so if they wiped out all the people, then wild beasts might destroy God's chosen people, and he didn't want that to happen. There were other reasons. But the point is, we don't always need to know why God acts like he acts. We just need to know that most often, God works through steps in our life for us to show our allegiance to him and follow him and trust him and claim the promises that he gives us as he gives those promises to us. When you hear from God, 
and trust His promises, you will learn that He is faithful. And He's going to do His part. He's going to do what He has said He's going to do. But we have to trust Him on His terms. Not our terms, not our wishes, but on His terms. And when you hear from God and trust His promises and learn that He's faithful, then you can see Him work and fulfill His promises. So what promises of God are you claiming and living by today? Some promises are conditional. And these conditional promises are true that we can claim, and there are hundreds of them in the Bible. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, the promise from God is that He's going to bless His people. He says, and I quote, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, the promise is that I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. But the premise to the promise, the condition of the promise, is if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. There's a condition to that promise. Another example would be like in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, where the Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God doesn't promise that under any condition, He's going to just save every person. Unfortunately, that is not the case. There's a condition to that promise. If we confess our sin, that means we have to understand that we're a sinner and repent of our sin and confess our sin to God, admit that we've sinned. And when we do that and ask God to forgive us, then the promise is He will forgive us. So hundreds of God's promises in the Bible are conditional. And they're conditional for our benefit and for God's glory. But there's also another kind of promise, and that is an unconditional promise. And that's what we see David crying out for here in Psalm 61. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, that same prophet Nathan, that earlier years had come to David and said, You are the man who have sinned against God. You've committed adultery. You've committed murder. You're the man who sinned. That same pro prophet in First Samuel chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13 says this, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come from, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. See, this is an unconditional promise from God to David. And David was claiming that promise at this particular time in his life. Another example of an unconditional promise for us today might be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, where the Bible says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. See, that's not a conditional promise. That's an unconditional promise. Just as sure as Jesus Christ came here and walked here on this earth and lived on this earth and demonstrated what it was like because He was God, demonstrated what it was like to be God, and then sacrificed His life, bled on a cross to die for your sin and my sin, and then on the third day arose again, just as surely as that is a historical fact that happened, Jesus Christ promised that He is coming back again 
to bring His church back together again and unite us all together for eternity. That is an unconditional promise from God. And I believe we're getting very close to that day because of the signs of the times around us. Jesus is coming back again. And I trust that you are ready to claim that promise because you have trusted in His blood to set you free from the penalty of your sin. So these promises, conditional and unconditional, are loaded for us in the Bible. And I want to challenge you over the next few weeks to look at reading your Bible through the lens of God's promises. Finally today, the fourth bedrock principle to know and to obey based on the life of David is this. God sustains through praise. He sustains through praise. We see this in verse 8. Verse 8 says, So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. In, in David's greatest time of trouble, what did he do? He turned to give praises to God. He turned to worship God in his greatest time of trouble. And we've seen this so often before uh, in this second book of the Psalms. David called on God in sincere worship and praise. So the outlook at this particular time in David's life was threatening. He was being pursued by enemies. He was under attack. But he anticipated God's deliverance, and he sang praises to the name of God. Now I want you to notice something about this, this prayer of praise from David in verse 8. Notice that he promised his obedience to the Lord. He says, so I will ever sing praise to your name as I perform my vows day after day. See, worship is never complete until there's action. And David demonstrated that he was performing his vows to God. He was being obedient to the vows that he had made to God. And even under attack, that didn't stop him from showing his love and allegiance to God in worship. See, worship drives active ministry. Uh, during these days, these struggling days that we're going through, we can find ways to reach out and encourage other people through ministries of our life, just like uh, the chaplain of the Loyola Basketball School, uh, Sister Jean. We can find ways to call people and text people and write to people and uh, provide food for people who are in need and in trouble. So let me ask you, when, when is a good time to worship? When is a good time to do like David and pay our vows to God and pour out our heart in praise to God? Well, when the going is good and easy and things are going like we would like for them to go, that's when we should worship. But also when the going gets tough, when things are hard, when things are difficult, when things are depressing, when the world seems to be caving in around us, that's a good time to worship. So all times are good times to worship. Let me explain what I mean by worship. When I talk about worship here, I'm not talking about form. I'm not talking about the form of worship. I'm talking about substance. Worship is walking with God in the light of His Word. Worship is doing God's will as He abides with us still. Worship is giving our burdens and our sorrows and our grief, our toils to God. Worship is trusting God through our grief and through our loss and through our sickness and bearing our cross. Worship is being blessed as we trust God and as we obey God. Worship is walking in the delights of God's love. Worship is laying our life on the altar in exchange for the favor and joy that God bestows on His faithful ones. Worship is sitting at the feet of Jesus and sweet fellowship with Him. Worship is going where God sends, never fearing 
only trusting and obeying. So over a hundred years ago, John Samus wrote, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This man lived through some very tough times. He lived through a pandemic just like we're living through. And in the words to that great old song, he's given us a solid rock to hold on to. David knew that his solid rock was his relationship with God. And you and I today can have that solid rock that we can hold on to that will give our hearts the strength to burst into praise and worship and service even in the days of our pandemic. And that comes to us today through trusting and obeying God through Jesus. And oh, how I pray that you have that kind of relationship with God today. So what are three things that we can take away from this psalm today, this great Psalm 61? Because there's great news here. We can experience the relationship with God that David had in our generation today. First of all, I want to remind us that God sustains those who know Him. You may be like John Wesley. You may be struggling today because as you've listened to the words of Psalm 61, maybe you've been convicted that you don't really have a relationship with God. Well, don't let another moment go by without coming to know God. If His Holy Spirit is pulling you toward His heart today, admit that you're a sinner. Say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin as I repent of my sin and turn away from my sin and turn to you. I want to know you. And as you forgive me of my sin, thank you for forgiving me and being my personal Savior. The second thing we take away from this psalm is that not only does God sustain those who know Him, but God sustains those who trust Him and obey Him, who trust Him and obey Him. During these stressful, stormy times, are you secure in your relationship with God through Jesus? If not, trust Him and then be willing to obey Him. Because finally, when you do know Him and when you trust Him and when you obey Him, thirdly, God sustains those who worship Him. Oh, how I'm looking forward to next Sunday when we come back together again, God willing, and gather us a body of Christ in corporate worship. But please understand, you don't have to wait till then to worship God. When you know Him, when you trust Him, when you obey Him, you can't help but pour your heart out to Him and praise Him and worship Him. God sustains and strengthens the faint-hearted who put our trust in Him. I have to admit, over the last few months, there have been times when my heart has just felt faint, desperate, even desolate. And I know that I have been sustained by my faith in God. And so for you, there's a battle out there that's going on. And there's one battle that truly just depends on you. It's between you and God, and that's the battle for your soul. So in closing today, I want to encourage you to make sure that that battle has been secured, that battle has been won, that you have given your life to God, that you're walking with Him, trusting Him, obeying Him, and saying, now God, what? I want my next step to be like David to have a faith in you that carries me through the storm and gives me the capacity to be able to be used by you, by God, to be of ministry to other people, effective ministry because it comes from the heart.
It comes from the soul. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ that gives strength to be the feet and be the arms of God himself. God, how I pray today that as we wrap up this psalm and just turn to you for clarity, for a clear word, for guidance, for direction. God, I pray that you would build our faith. I pray that you would give the one who has come to understand today that they're struggling because they don't really have faith in you. God, I pray that you would give that person faith. Call them to yourself so they can trust in you and repent of their sin and know that they are secure in your hands. And God, I pray that you would put the joy of the Lord in our hearts, those of us who know you, so that not only can we know you, but we can praise you and we can roll up our sleeves and go to work with you, not for our salvation, but because you have rescued us. God, take us and use us like never before for your honor and your glory. Thank you for the challenge that you've given us from your word today. And continue to bless us with that word as we move through today, as we move through this coming week, until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.